Hello, welcome to an adventure. Happy Wednesday. It is good to see all of you here today. Um, it's Wednesday, which means it's Archival Adventures Day here on uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Uh, presumably, if you're watching this, you're on one of those channels. If you're watching it from somewhere else, I'm not sure how you're doing that. And maybe come over to one of those channels because that's where the stats come uh, that let me keep doing the show. So, <laughs> hi Hannah and hi Simsilica. Um, sorry. Cord issues. Always cord issues. There are so many cords in this room. Uh, the, the camera and the lights and the c number of devices in this room to make this stream function are truly remarkable. Uh, someday I may actually have to um, present about that, which will be fun because I only know, like, I don't know, maybe 60% of how it works. Um, <laughs> So anyway, before we dive into things, let me go ahead and start the stream the way that I always start the stream with the Land and Labor Acknowledgement from Virginia Tech, uh, which is the institution that houses the archives that I share things from and where I work. So I feel it very important to go ahead and share that uh, every stream. So uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples, and other native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history and increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to ut prosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So, today's March 2nd. Today's March 2nd. Mental note, today's March 2nd. Uh, <laughs> it is the start of Women's History Month here, but uh, I have not specifically programmed anything for Women's History Month this year. We did do uh, like Women's Month last year. I may do something toward the end of the month, um, but at the moment I don't have plans. If you do want me to see, uh, if you do want me to pull specifically Women's History things later in the month, do let me know that because I can totally do that. I take requests. Um, what we have today <laughs> instead, um, the title of the episode is Olives in the Archives. And I chose that purely for selfish reasons. Sort of. Yes, selfish reasons. Uh, one of my favorite uh, streaming groups, as you know, on this channel, on VTUL Studios channel, we actually do stream tabletop role-playing games on occasion. Uh, we have a show called Roll of Play. and. Um, Streaming tabletop role-playing games is a thing on Twitch. And uh, there is a show starting on Monday from the Streampunks RPG group, uh, which is probably my favorite tabletop role-playing game uh, streaming group. Um, <clears throat> they're playing a campaign of Changeling the, the Dreaming. Uh, and the title of it is Barony of Olives. So since that is starting on Monday in honor of them, I decided to see what our archives had on the topic of olives. And so today I will share with you everything I was able to find about olives in honor of the Barony of Olives. Uh, <laughs> you like March, it's your birthday month. It's also the month you get your hair colored purple, your brother's wedding anniversary and your nephew's birthday month. That is, it's also my mother's birthday month. So yeah, it is a, March is a good month. Um, but yeah, so purely selfish reasons, because I'm a fan and they're starting a new show that has the word olives in the name, I decided, why don't we look at some things about olives? Because we have a food and uh, a, a history of food and drink collection. We've got to have something on olives, right? 
Well, it turned out to be a lot harder to find things on olives than one would think. Uh, partly because we don't organize the food and drink collection by topical uh, subjects of specific individual food items. So if you want to search for things on cheese, it's going to be difficult. If you want to search for things about flour, it's going to be difficult. If you want to search for things about bell peppers, it's going to be difficult because we don't organize the collection by here's things on cheese and here's things on bell peppers and here's things on olives. Uh, so it's, it's a particularly challenging research question if you have a specific dish or a specific food item that you're looking for because that's not how the collection is organized. <clears throat> if you want to research cuisine from a specific region, that's a lot easier. If you want to research cuisine from a specific time period, that's a lot easier. But uh, researching based on specific food item is much harder. Um, if you want to look for trends, say like uh, World War I um, uh, farming initiatives in Britain and the US, we have material on that. If you want to look at sort of um, promotional items, uh, the, the cookbooks that were put out by companies to promote their own products, we've seen some of those on stream. We have that, that's easy to find. Those are uh, culinary pamphlets. Um, and so those things, uh, that type of search is easy. But if you want to research, say, the history of milk, that is going to be much, much harder. So searching for everything about olives was difficult. Oh my gosh, and we've got 16-bit Eric raiding with a party of 44. 16-bit uh, Eric, the GM of the aforementioned Barony of Olives game starting on Monday. Welcome in, uh, Whimsies. Um, as you can see from the stream title, this episode is titled Olives in the Archives, and I chose to find whatever I could about olives in honor of the Streampunk's new game starting on Monday, Barony of Olives. So I was just explaining that searching by uh, food item is actually really difficult. <laughs> and so we're gonna see what I was able to find. Um, oh, Be Right UK, thank you for the 250 bits. Are there gardens in the archive to go along with the olives or just a barony? Um, so we do have gardens. We do not specifically have gardens of olives. <laughs> <laughs> in our archives. Um, we do have history of food and drink, but we don't have a uh, history of restaurants per se, um, unless the restaurant were to put out a cookbook, in which case we would have the cookbook, most likely. Uh, as far as I know, Olive Garden has never put out a cookbook, so, um, so we don't have an Olive Garden cookbook. But um, welcome in, it is great to have you all here. Uh, thank you, Eric, so much for bringing everybody over. Um, I think it's time that we dive in and see what I was able to find about olives uh, in honor of the Barony of Olives coming up Monday. Um, definitely check out Streampunks RPG on Twitter to find out more information on that um, because, you know, I control this stream. I can pick the topics and I love Streampunks RPG group. And so I picked olives in honor of their new show. Okay, I think we move to, uh, <laughs> I think we move to the camera now. Um, <coughs> let's see, what do I have? Document focus. So, uh, an easy place to start for material about olives in a collection that includes a history of the American cocktail is the martini. So I found a couple of items about martinis that also talk about olives. Uh, and I think we'll start with one of them. This one is from 1950. It is called How to Be a Master Martini Mixer. It's easier than you think. Uh, let's see. So they want 
A light, dry, smooth martini that tells the world, here's a man who serves the best gin and finest vermouth. Crystal clear, practically colorless. I'm looking for my olive content. I know there's a mention of olives in here. <laughs> you control the horizontal. You control the vertical. Welcome to the archive zone. Yes, uh, I control the horizontal. I control the vertical. Welcome to the archive zone. <laughs> I, I get the reference, Be Right UK. It took me a second to, to go there. Um, sadly, I do not have the voice uh, to say it properly. The oldest piece about olives that I found, um, so it depends on what you mean by old. We, we will look at it. This is actually from 1984. Four, but it is a print, it, it is a reproduction of a book from the 15th century. So uh, I'm turning it sideways so I can actually show the cover page. Uh, when we actually get to this, I will, I will turn it differently. But um, this is uh, Livre de Simples Medicines, um, a 15th century French herbal <laughs> um, and so the book that I'm actually showing here is the translation of it um, so this is a reproduction from 1984 of a 15th century work that had something about olives um, otherwise I don't know the spring housekeepers list I don't know if there's a date on it It's, it's really surprising how little we had on olives. Um, why was it always men serving drinks and not women in these settings? You have no real answer, you just find... Um, it's interesting. So, historically speaking, societally speaking, uh, in Western culture, especially like the 40s and 50s, uh, you have two. You have a dichotomy. You have two different portrayals of of people. So you've got, uh, and honestly, to this day, you you do as well. Um, if you think of a cocktail waitress, so uh, the stereotypical image of a cocktail waitress is kind of the short, poofy skirt with the low top. Uh, I'm thinking. Um, I mean, it's just. Betty Boop kind of look, uh, although she was not necessarily a, a cocktail waitress, she was the cigar, uh, cigarette girl. Um, but that kind of styling, that kind of look was the idea of a cocktail waitress. Um, they were not associated with sophisticated locations. Sophisticated locations were uh, more staid and associated with male cocktail mixers, uh, men who actually made the drinks and served the drinks, and those were considered more sophisticated uh, and less frivolous. Um, so it, I think it goes back to the understanding of gender roles within the United States in the 1940s and 1950s, um, the idea that women belonged in the kitchen and in the home and th their thoughts were frivolous uh, as composed uh, as compared to the more serious and um, uh, worldly thoughts of men uh, so you get the same thing across industry um, where male doctors are respected women doctors are not men uh, it, it's interesting, like, if you look at the library profession, the stereotypical image of a librarian is a woman, but if you look at library administration historically and the people who actually defined things like the Dewey Decimal System, the Library of Congress classification system, the way that we actually describe material, it's all men. Uh, because the people in charge, the people running the libraries were men, but the librarians were women. Um, it, so the, it, it, yeah, nurses were women, but doctors were men. 
the kind, it's, it's the same thing. You've got the sophisticated cocktail uh, place that has a male, uh, a man serving the drinks. And then you've got the cocktail bar with the cocktail waitress that's sort of a more seedy place, a more frivolous place. Uh, and it's got women serving the drinks instead. I think that that is probably it. Uh, waitresses may have served the drinks, but barmen would have mixed them first because nonsense. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, the, the, the image for me that comes to mind when I think of the stereotypical cocktail waitress is Esri Dax in season seven of Deep Space Nine, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, um, in the episode Bada Bing Bada Bang, which is my favorite episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Uh, and she is decked out as a stereotypical, um, like I'd say 1960s era Las Vegas cocktail waitress uh, because it's a holodeck episode and it's really good. Um, but the costumer there did an excellent job of portraying that character in the stereotypical cocktail waitress outfit. Uh, any, anyway, <laughs> thank you for the question though, Hannah. That was, that was a, took us on a little bit of a, 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 a detour there, but an interesting one. So this is um, clearly a pamphlet actually advertising Lejon or Lejon uh, vermouth, three different brands of vermouth, compare Lejon with any other vermouth. Um, see which gives you the lightest, driest, smoothest martinis. But we still haven't gotten to the part with with olives, which is what we're actually concerned with, which, which is why I've been flipping through um, I mean, we've got a couple of illustrations with olives in them. But there was definitely mention of olives. I remember seeing it because I flipped through I don't know. I swear I saw in at least one of the recipes. Aha, here we go. <coughs> Boo boos, yay olives. <coughs> Pardon, one second. <coughs> I apologize. We're not here for cocktails today. We're here for olives. For smooth as frosted velvet martinis, three parts Gilby's dry gin, according to tastes, use more or less gin. One part Lejean dry vermouth, <clears throat> which is clearly the company that paid for this booklet. A dash of orange bitters. Stir with ice, strain, serve with olive. If desired, twist lemon peel for oil, for oil spray over top. It's a lovely design. Um, not really about olives, but I felt that Martini's was a place to go to actually see mention of olives, at least. Uh, isn't H the opposite of dry? I'm not sure. So dry vermouth, you've got dry vermouth and sweet vermouth, if I'm remembering correctly. Those are the, those are the binary of vermouth, is dry or sweet. Um, which I think is the same with wine. It's either dry or it's sweet. Uh, so not dry and wet, but dry and sweet, I believe are the dichotomy there. Um, here we have an item from 1975. This is the other uh, martini related item. These are the only two alcohol related ones that I pulled. Um, famous restaurants, bartenders, martini recipes. <clears throat> and this one, this one, they definitely will include olives because if you look, the design of this item includes olives. Uh, as you can see, there's the olives over here and the one with pimento in it, the one with the little red filled in dot is the one whose recipe you're currently looking at. Oh, be right, you can't, you can't handle vermouth. Oh dear. That was excellent. That was very excellent. Um, all right, so 
what we have here at 1975, we've got uh, New York's The 21 Club, and their martini recipe is uh, one-fifth of Tribune over Muth, four-fifths gin. Stir well and serve in chilled cocktail glass in which a drop of Pernod was rolled around and discarded. <laughs> Garnish with olive, onion, or lemon peel as you wish. That seems rather pretentious to me. <clears throat> serve it in a chilled glass that you put a drop of Pernod in, rolled it around, poured out, and then you put the martini in. I guess that's to give just the slightest hint of the flavor of whatever that is. I don't know what Pernod is, but um, wow, that is, that is very pretentious. Uh, so if we pull the little card down, we move to the next recipe. Uh, once, once the second olive there has pimento in it, we have the martini recipe from Harry's Bar in Los Angeles. Pernod has an anise or black licorice flavor. Interesting. It's not one that I was familiar with, so. Uh, fill the pitcher with one third, of, one third ice. Now quickly pour the gin of your choice over. Lore has it that Hemingway counted to six as he poured. Next, allow the gin to pour freely into a chilled glass. The final touch? Add the two olives you have been bathing in Tribuno, Tribuno Vermouth. Now you may proceed to imbibe in earnest. So interesting, <clears throat> this is a gin martini uh, that is all gin. The only vermouth is in the olives themselves. Like you don't actually add vermouth to the drink. It's just that you soaked the olives in vermouth. And so without the olives, there would be no vermouth. Pernod, thank you, Just Here for Coffee. A French aniseed liqueur. It, it honestly, as soon as you said, uh, Hannah, as soon as you said that it was anise flavored, it, it is not surprising to me that there is a, a, a Pernod brand of absinthe as well. That makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> All right, so the third one on here is from Crickets in Chicago. So we, we started with one olive, uh, then we went to Los Angeles and there were two olives that had been bathed in vermouth that honestly were essential to the drink because without them you would have no vermouth flavor at all. Uh, crickets in Chicago pour into a 24 ounce cocktail mixer with ice, one ounce of Tribune of vermouth and three ounces of gin. Stir and pour in a five ounce chilled cocktail glass. Add a lemon twist and sit back and have the best martini in the world. So this one actually doesn't include an olive at all. <coughs> um, it would not surprise me, Hannah, if Tribuno had uh, done this. Actually, indeed, you are correct. Uh, here at the bottom, you see Tribuno Vermouth listed um, on the bottom. So it is definitely another a branding item. So that is half of this. But if you flip it to the other side, we also have three more restaurants in Chicago, LA, and New York. So the first one is the Pump Room in Chicago. Booth one martini for two. Pour two ounces of Tribuno Vermouth over small cubed ice. Stir with a delicate hand, then strain. The distinctive flavor of Tribuno will season remaining ice. Add four ounces of the finest gin or vodka. Stir gently so as not to bruise. Strain into crystal glasses. The final touch is a lemon peel marinated for three hours in one ounce each of cognac and benedictine, gently twisted over and around the rim of the glasses. So that one also doesn't have olives. That would be my guess as well. Um, <laughs> Hannah, that these are not always made with that brand, or were not always made with that brand, but uh, that this was, you know, this is a marketing thing. Uh, uh, so, <coughs> it's probably some variation of their recipe. Also for 1973, this is in really, really good, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is remarkably well-preserved for uh, 
1975, but, um, I mean, this is ephemera. This is not something that is expected to survive the passage of time. So the fact that it is in the condition that it's in is actually really nice, or really good. Um, <clears throat> let's see, this one is uh, Ma Maison in Los Angeles. Fill a shaker glass three fingers high with ice. Take two martini glasses and place two ice cubes in each. Now pull three ounces of gin and two healthy squirts of Tribuno Vermouth into the shaker glass. Cover with a strainer and rotate clockwise at 60 revolutions per minute. While simultaneously rotating the martini glass counterclockwise at 120 revolutions per minute for 10 seconds. Vigorously shake out the martini glasses and strain the liqueur in or strain the liquor into them. Honestly, that seems overly pretentious to me, and it still doesn't have a freaking olive. There's olive decorations on the thing, and like half the recipes don't have olives. This is this is frustrating to me. Um, what if the bartender has huge hands? I, finger, I I don't know everything about cocktail making, but. Uh, Three fingers is a very specific measurement with regard to cocktails. I don't know what that measurement actually is. I just know it is a specific measurement. It is a standardized measurement, at, at least today. Um, <clears throat> I'm more concerned with the uh, rotate one item clockwise at 60 revolutions per minute while rotating another item simultaneously counterclockwise at 120 revolutions per minute. A, how are we measuring revolutions per minute? And so that requires doing like this, I guess. But why clockwise and counterclockwise? That doesn't seem like it's absolutely essential. Why must they be done simultaneously? I mean, as far as Ma Maison, I understand why the restaurant might want to do that because if you've ever, <clears throat> If you've ever seen the movie Cocktail uh, with Tom Cruise, uh, or if you've ever seen an actual like bartender that does performance, um, there, there are cocktail bars that do very performative uh, stunt work, essentially, uh, in making the drinks, uh, flipping things over their heads and things like that. So this is, this is describing to you the specific performance of how you should make this drink. I don't think that the revolutions per minute achieved and the clockwise and counterclockwise actually affect the final product in any way. <clears throat> if the barman has big hands, you get a bigger drink. It's a non... Oh, okay, so it's a non-standardized but useful averaging system to allow roughly equal measures to be poured by eye. I had thought it was standardized. So, interesting gesture for coffee. So the final one on here is at Sardi's in New York. <clears throat> Fill a, pardon me, <clears throat> I apologize. <clears throat> <clears throat> it is quite stuffy in here and it, it um, likes to trigger my, uh, my sinuses a little. Fill a clear cocktail mixer slash glass three quarters full with clear new ice cubes. Splash with Tribuno Vermouth. Add two and a half ounces of Beefeater's Gin. <clears throat> Stir rapidly 10 times with a silver spoon. Pour all into a stemmed goblet. Retain the Tribuno treated ice. Drop in three olives. <clears throat> Serve the perfect martini on the rocks, Sardis style. So now we've got three olives. <clears throat> the last three recipes didn't have olives at all, but this one's got three. One of them had two. So we still have six olives total being used if you, if you make all of these drinks. And in this case, they mention specifically a silver spoon. And that is very particular. Um, the use of a silver spoon as opposed to, say, a stainless steel spoon will actually change the flavor of the drink. The alcohol interacting with the silver will react in such a way as to slightly alter the flavor, which is why they specify a silver spoon. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, they've apparently tried to standardize the amount more recently. It's about one ounce per finger. Hannah, thank you for that. So 
that is just an interesting little disposable item that we have because we have that uh, History of the American Cocktail collection. That's why Moscow mules are served in copper cups. Indeed, um, Moscow mule, uh, in fact, every type of mule with a mule is a very specific type of <clears throat> alcoholic drink. Um, and mules are served in copper vessels because the copper changes the flavor of the drink. Um, and if it's not actual copper, you're not getting the intended experience of a mule. So let's see, we've got, those were the only two alcohol ones that I had today. And we've got them out of the way. Uh, I'm, I'm zooming in, I, me I meant to be zooming out. One second. So the next item is from the California Olive Advisory Board. <clears throat> and this item is from a date sometime in the past. <laughs> Love how specific that is, right? I don't actually know. We may not know the date, but based on the food styling in it, I would say probably 1970s. <clears throat> we get the story of ripe olives to start. And yes, it is black and white. Uh, it is not in color. <clears throat> oh yeah, uh, there are different kinds of mules. Um, just as there, so if you've ever heard of like an Irish coffee, um, there's an Italian coffee, there's a Dutch coffee, there's different kinds of alcoholic coffees as well. Um, and in similar fashion, there are different kinds of mules as well. So Moscow mule is the most famous one, but there are definitely other ones. <clears throat> and basically, uh, the, the difference being um, they're all prepared in a similar fashion, but include different alcohols in them, uh, which is where they get the different names. <laughs> you learn stuff today, just not about olives. I mean, it is marked as an educational stream, so I'm happy to have helped you learn something. Uh, hopefully you'll learn something about olives through the course of today as well. At least you'll learn that it was very difficult for me to find material on olives, and um, you'll learn what I was able to find in our archives. So at the very least, that's what you'll learn today. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me, I'm sorry uh, about the throat clearing. Yes, just here for coffee. Uh, Moscow mule is vodka, Cuban mule is rum. Um, Uh, do, 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 do. I was, aha. So yeah, if you go and you do some simple searching, <clears throat> there's the Caribbean mule, which is rum and ginger beer. Uh, the Kentucky mule, which is bourbon and ginger beer. The London mule, which is gin and ginger beer, the Long Island mule, which is vodka, white rum, tequila, gin, triple sec, uh, there's a few things in there, the, Mosca, or the, the Mexican mule, which is tequila and ginger beer, southern, uh, which is sweet tea, vodka, and ginger beer. Um, so th there's variations on it. Um, and in similar fashion, if you go, um, So with Irish coffee is, um, wow, my brain won't tell me which alcohol goes in Irish coffee, but it's the standard that everybody knows. But like an Italian coffee would be amaretto instead uh, as the alcoholic uh, ingredient in the coffee drink. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, it's the same way. 
like if you were to put tequila in coffee, which I'm not sure why you would do, uh, it would be a Mexican coffee in similar fashion. Um, and there's, there's a variety of them that are standardized and, and done typically. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna read the story of ripe olives. <laughs> California ripe olives. Today, California produces 99% of all American grown olives. <laughs> Little did the Franciscan Padres realize back in 1767 when they brought the first olive tree cuttings to California that they were laying the cornerstone of a tremendous industry. They planted the trees around their missions for shade and for the olive oil they would produce. As years went by, the warm, dry interior valleys proved even better than the coastal area for growing olives. By the middle 1880s, olive growing had become a commercial industry in California. A wonderful discovery was made in 1900 when it was learned olives could be canned like other fruits. Oh yeah, olives are fruits, in case you did not know. <clears throat> they're not berries, they're not vegetables, they are fruits. The California ripe olives were like nothing else anyone had ever tasted and were a far cry from the bitter, salt-cured European ripe olives. These new olives had a rich, mellow, nut-like flavor. They were black on the outside and light brown on the inside. At first, just the folks in California knew about ripe olives, but gradually people visiting here from other parts of the country began sampling them and liking them and taking some back home with them. <clears throat> Today, no matter where you live, you can buy California ripe olives. Olive growers and packers developed over the years their present day cultural and processing methods with the approval of the California Department of Health, resulting in this present day superior product. During the curing process, the bitter tasting ripe olives as they come from the tree are almost magically transformed into rich, mellow flavored fruit. These are then packed in brine in sealed containers and sterilized. Hi, Key Squared, welcome in. I'm glad that your tech crises were dealt with. <clears throat> and be right, UK, I think you are right. Uh, Irish coffee would be whiskey. <laughs> <coughs> Sizes and containers. The ripe olive industry was a pioneer in the field of informative labeling. Each label shows specifically the size of the olive as well as indicating how many olives are in each container. Both pitted and whole ripe olives are graded according to size and packed in a variety of tin and glass containers, ranging from the small buffet sizes to a quart size. Chopped and sliced ripe olives are packed in buffet sized tins for home use. There is an appropriate size and pack for every purpose. Romance. California ripe olives are comparatively new but the olive itself is the earliest fruit mentioned in history. The trees live longest of all trees bearing fruit. The family background is rich and romantic. Olives were first grown by the Assyrians and then taken to the Holy Land. The six remaining olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane, familiar landmarks for tourists traveling in the Holy Land, are known to be well over 2,000 years old. Four and five hundred year old groves in southern France, Italy, Spain, and Greece are still bearing commercially viable fruits. During the 17th and 18th centuries, olives were grown to some extent in Mexico, and it was from there the Padres brought them to California. <clears throat> oh no! Your internet went out! I hope that it um, comes back for you. So then we get some recipes for what you can do with olives. Uh, they have a garden salad bowl that includes some sliced olives on top, as you can see. Let's see what else we have. I do not want to restart this computer, thank you. It is being used at present. 
lovely 1970s cuisine. Actually, this this could be any time between the 50s and the 70s. Based on the, so I, I'm going to tell you, I think it is the 1970s, based on the food styling, but honestly, the food styling doesn't give it away completely because this food styling could be as old as the 50s. It's the color of the photograph that makes me think that it is the 1970s. It is the, the color saturation, um, the exposure, the, so not just the food styling, but the actual, like, the yellows and the greens and the, the um, reddish orange here. Um, <clears throat> the quality of the color in the photograph itself that makes me think that this is 1970s, despite there not being a date on the item itself. Luncheon salad loaf is the one that you see pictured here. It is two envelopes of plain gelatin, a quarter cup of cold water, one cup of tomato sauce, two tablespoons of vinegar, a half teaspoon of salt, two cups of cottage cheese, one cup of whole or pitted ripe olives, a half cup of mayonnaise, one cup of finely chopped celery, one third cup of finely chopped green sweet pepper, and one quarter cup of diced pimento. <clears throat> nice. Jello mold. 70s were a warm brown color. Yeah. <coughs> it does not sound appetizing at all. Um, so savory jellos, savory gelatin was a thing for quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> uh, the Jello company, the one that we most of us think of Jello, in at least in the U.S., we think of the brand name Jello when we're thinking of gelatin products because it's what we're familiar with. It's what we've grown up with. Um, there's also another major gelatin company in the U.S. called Knox Gelatin, K-O-N-A-X, or K-N-O-X, um, that typically does unflavored gelatin. The Jello brand today has flavors like cherry, lime, grape, lemon, um, orange. They're the sweet flavors. <clears throat> but they used to have other flavors like garlic, onion, uh, etc. Et um, I, I don't know all of their previous savory flavors. Um, uh, I'll see if I can find them. <clears throat> Oh, um, no, that's celery. Um, they used to have a celery flavored jello. Um, actually, they have discontinued flavors on the jello Wikipedia page. Um, so some of they had a coffee flavored jello. They had, uh, I'm looking for savory ones specifically, Italian salad flavored jello. They had um, mixed vegetable jello. Uh, they used to have a plain, an unflavored jello. Uh, seasoned tomato. Tomato. Um, yeah, they also have a lot of other fruit flavors that have been discontinued, but. Um, celery, Italian salad, etc. As as Jello flavors were things that existed. So, um, it, but at the same time, gelatin was really popular from the 50s to the 70s for use in savory dishes. Uh, things like aspics um, <clears throat> and Jello molds and 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 whatnot were very common. So a celery flavored jello would probably have worked really well in this dish. <laughs> <clears throat> celery is the saddest flavor. Bitter water. Yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan of the flavor of celery myself, but let's see, what else have we got here? These seem to be stuffed tomato salads, including the olives there. <clears throat> Here's one. Lime glow salad. This remember this is an olive cookbook. Lime glow salad. Dissolve one package lime flavored gelatin in one and a half cups of 
hot water or fruit juice, blend in one cup of grapefruit sections, uh, half a teaspoon grated lemon rind, and one tablespoon lemon juice. Cool until slightly thickened and fold in one third cup of sliced ripe olives and three quarters cup of grated carrot. Chill until firm serves five. <clears throat> lemon jello made with hot water or fruit juice. <clears throat> Grapefruit sections, grated lemon rind and lemon juice, and sliced olives and grated carrot. <laughs> what if all you have is hot fruit juice? <laughs> I love the no, why? Um, I don't, I, I mean, you could consider that there was, like, they were like, well, olives are fruits. Let's treat them like fruits. Until you get to the part about the grated carrots. Because carrots are definitely not fruits. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't know. But these are actual recipes that were published to promote the use of olives. Creamy sandwich filling, egg salad sandwich filling, hors d'oeuvres and canapé tidbits, Old English olive rabbit. So here's a couple of things. Uh, naming it Old English does not have any meaning, <laughs> does not mean that this recipe came from England. Uh, just like when you see a company call something grandma's apple pie, it does not mean that there was a grandmother involved in the creation of that pie at all. Uh, those names are intended to give psychological effects that will affect how you feel about the food and therefore how you taste and experience the food. If you serve the same pie to someone in a blind taste test, uh, <clears throat> and you serve them two slices from the exact same pie. But one of them you tell them this is grandma's apple pie and the other one you tell them this is apple pie, they will prefer and indeed report that the slice that you called grandma's apple pie tastes better and will, will tell you why and how it tastes better than the other slice, even though both slices came from the same pie. And this has been actually tested and proven. Uh, so calling this Old English Olive Rabbit is probably a marketing ploy and not indicating that it's actually from England. Um, it's also interesting to note, uh, this is definitely made for an American audience and having a rabbit recipe in the 1970s um, is probably getting toward the end of the period of time where you see very many recipes for rabbit because today Americans don't really eat rabbit very much. <clears throat> Put olives and tomatoes together in a salad and technically you have a fruit salad, indeed. <laughs> Carrot cake is great. Carrots and jello? Nah. Why does your brain delight in suggesting that celery might taste of wet concrete and mold? Oh my, be right UK. <clears throat> oh, Detective Zen, it is, it is not the greatest name for a type of test. Um, I should say it's probably a better, better to call it a blindfolded taste test. Uh, but honestly, there's not even a need for a blindfold. Um, you could serve them two slices of the same pie, and we eat with our eyes first. So the visual of the food is important in how we perceive it and experience it. But yeah, um, <laughs> I, I appreciate the joke. It's not a rabbit dish, it's cheese on toast. It's rare bit. Which, uh, so rare bit, I hadn't looked. So yeah, you are indeed right. It's actually a rare bit. Um, they're calling it rabbit, but um, which is why I assumed it would have rabbit in it. 
Um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, I'm actually not surprised then for a recipe from the 70s to not actually have rabbit in it. Because um, rabbit as an ingredient, I, I would have to do some research. Um, just purely a guess. I do not know for certain. Rabbit, I know, used to be really common in American cuisine. Uh, I would guess that probably sometime around the 1930s is when it fell out of fashion. I would bet if I go and do research that sometime in at, like the 1940s is when I stop seeing rabbit used in recipes. Um, and I'm basing that guess on the, the Great Depression when people had to um, forage for food near their home uh, rather than buying it at the store because everybody was without jobs and everything was really expensive and um, rabbit would have been one of the things they could have hunted and so I imagine it probably fell out of fashion because people had been eating it during the hard times and didn't want to be reminded of those times by having those dishes. That's purely speculation on my part. I would be very interested to research that and find out. But I do know that it used to be a popular thing here in the U.S. and is no longer in fashion to eat. <clears throat> Rabbits have bad parasites. Your dad would only hunt them in winter and that was rare. I've only ever had farmed rabbit myself. <laughs> With the 70s ingredients playing havoc on people's arteries, who knows what the end result would be. Birds, squirrels, yeah. Yeah, my grandparents um, grew up during the Depression and uh, I remember they, them showing me like the trees down the, down the road from them where they used to go to harvest, I don't even remember which fruits it was, but they regularly went there to get food from the trees down the, down the road from them. Um, and they lived on a farm, so it was, they were farming food anyway, but they still had to supplement by picking it from the, just the random trees that they hadn't planted. At work one time, there was a cull of the wild rabbits running around the grounds. Coincidentally, the restaurant served a rabbit meal. No one ate it. Um, yeah, wild rabbit, I'm not sure I would trust. Same with, like, wild squirrel. Um, just because of, of disease concerns. But uh, there are a couple farms. I know there's a rabbit farm in Wisconsin that sells rabbit uh, to butchers. Um, so it's possible to get in the U.S., just not common. Just like goose. Uh, I believe goose is much more common in Europe <clears throat> as a protein. Uh, and in the U.S., it's almost impossible to find goose. You can get duck, you can get turkey, but goose is not something that is readily available here. Um, or peacock. You're not going to find peacock or pheasant here either really easily. Um... So, uh, Old English Olive Rarebit, half a cup of whole or pitted ripe olives, a tablespoon of butter or margarine, a tablespoon of flour, a half a cup of milk, two cups diced cheese food, diced cheese food, they mean Velveeta, uh, a half a teaspoon of salt, a quarter teaspoon of dry mustard, a quarter teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce, a dash of cayenne pepper, and crisp toast or crackers. Um, yeah, diced cheese food is a generic way of talking about what we know as the brand name Velveeta, which is a very plastic cheese product. It is not actually cheese and I assume can't legally be called cheese because they don't call it cheese. It is cheese food. Um, it melts really well which is why you would want to use it in a rare bit. <laughs> yes, diced cheese food. Uh, but it, it's based on like American style cheese, American cheese, um, which is a, 
a very olive oil based, or not olive oil, a very uh, like vegetable oil based product in, in most cases. Um, and Velveeta is the name brand that we would know, um, at least in the US. I assume Velveeta is available elsewhere, but uh, Velveeta, yes, processed American cheese food product. Um, Velveeta being the, the brand name that comes to mind and that people would be most familiar with for cheese food product. Um, shrimp olive casserole. Mmm. You see the little shrimps in the middle with olives on the sides and mmm. So this, this by the people who make or who grow the olives, trying to get you to buy olives and none of the dishes in this pamphlet are particularly enticing to me. And I love olives. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, the back page here. Did you know? Oh, you've looked for it and not been able to find it as an imported thing. It probably, yeah, it's possible that your health agencies will not allow it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but also it's, it's a, it's a uniquely American item. <laughs> um, all right, did you know all ri ripe olive labels are plainly marked with an imprint of the actual size of the olives and also the average number of olives to be found within that particular container? The nine standard sizes of ripe olives are small, medium, large, extra large, mammoth, jumbo, colossal, and super colossal. Small olives average 135 per pound and super colossal olives average 32 per pound. The mammoth olive averages about 70 per pound. You may buy ripe olives in a variety of tin and glass containers, the four and a half, six and seven ounce buffet sizes, nine ounce tall and cylinder pints, no, number two and a half regular and tall cylinder quarts, number 10 containers, and are available for institutional use. Ripe olives are packed whole, pitted, sliced, and chopped. All, all have the same high quality, the same rich, nut-like flavor. Good and good for you. <laughs> Mammoth olives are challenge rating six and have a trample attack. <laughs> they have a title that says good and good for you. I'm guessing an editor didn't come with the pamphlet. <clears throat> Originally, Velveeta was made from real cheese. Today, it's mainly whey protein concentrate. Interesting. So people with um, um, gluten uh, allergies would probably not be able to... No, well, sorry. Whey. My brain went to wheat. Uh, whey makes sense. Um, milk protein concentrate. Milk, milk fat. Or Sorry. Milk protein concentrate. Milk fat and preservatives. By the Food and Drug Administration standards, that's not real cheese, which is why the FDA forced Kraft to change its label from cheese spread to cheese product. So all of those ingredients, though, are milk related. They are all... So it's just the combination that they have, the FDA doesn't classify as cheese. That's interesting. Um, also, like margarine, uh, margarine is an oil-based product that approximates butter and can't be called butter because of the way that it's made. Uh, yeah. Mammoth olives are, oh, no bleeding huge olives? No. Shiny mammoth olives are hard to spawn. Oh, Detective Zen, Pokemon reference. Um, okay. Let's read good and good for you. <clears throat> Ripe olives are outstanding for their high 19% fruit oil content. Did you know that olive oil is fruit oil? It's oil from a fruit. This unique fruit oil is highly digestible and contributes much to their rich flavor. Compared with other fruits, ripe olives have exceptionally high calcium and iron values. 
vitamin A, riboflavin, and thiamine are present in ripe olives in goodly amounts. A small olive contains 5 calories, a super colossal olive 15 calories. Ripe olives are an acceptable food for everyone, including small children. Serving tips. After being opened, ripe olives may be stored almost indefinitely in their own liquid in the refrigerator. <clears throat> their original container may be used. Whole ripe olives are most suitable to serve as is, as a relish or on the appetizer tray. <clears throat> Chopped ripe olives are ideal for sandwiches and sauces, and the pitted variety, either sliced or whole, is most convenient to use in casseroles or salads. I note here that they're not mentioning pimento at all, uh, which I find interesting since um, so often in the U.S. you find olives with pimento, uh, or I believe it's garlic. You either get garlic stuffed or pimento stuffed olives, and um, they're widely seen. Um, I prefer my olives unstuffed, personally, but... <clears throat> uh, chopped ripe olives are ideal for sandwiches and sauces, and the pitted variety, either sliced or whole, is most convenient to use in casseroles or salads. To keep the shiny gloss of ripe olives, drain them well and roll in a few drops of olive or salad oil. Ripe olives are delicious, served hot or cold. Try heating them in their liquid, to which may be added chili powder, curry powder, or dry mustard to taste. To cut ripe olives from pits easily, cut into quarters and loosen wedges from the pit with tip of sharp knife, or simply slice fruit from pit. Printed in USA, these recipes were developed and prepared by California Foods Research Institute, San Francisco. No matter how many times you hear riboflavin, it still doesn't sound like something you want inside your body. <clears throat> I don't actually know what riboflavin is. It's a word that got tossed around so much. I never actually thought to wonder what it is. Uh, riboflavin is vitamin B2. So it is, it is a vitamin. or a vitamin, uh, widely found in both plant and animal-based foods, including milk, meat, eggs, nuts, enriched flour, and green vegetables. Involved in many body processes, it's prepared for the proper, it's required for the proper development of the skin, li skin lining of the digestive tract, blood cells, and brain function. People most commonly use riboflavin to prevent uh, riboflavin deficiency. <clears throat> for migraine, and for high levels of uh, homocysteine, homo, homocysteine in the blood, it's also used for acne, muscle cramps, and other, many other conditions, but there is no good scientific evidence to support these other uses. <clears throat> so it is a vitamin uh, that is healthy for the skin, digestive tract, blood cells, and brain function. <laughs> Be right, UK. Thank you for the 500 bits. Um, use pressed olives. Resistance is fruit oil. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Call it a vitamin, not a name thrown together with random Scrabble tiles. <clears throat> Scurvy pre prevention. Some silica. Yeah, I think you would be right there. <clears throat> All right. We have looked at <laughs> Two martini books and one pamphlet. There's more. But wait, there's more. <clears throat> Next I have... J.R. Stafford's Family Recipe Book. We're not going to look at the entire thing. This item would have been very appropriate when I was doing um, patent medicines. Um, those, you know, fake flimflam medicines um, that claim to cure everything. <clears throat> so J.R. Stafford's family receipt book contains 250 household receipts and several very recent discoveries and improvements in agriculture and mechanics. Also an explanation of most of the diseases which afflict humanity illustrated by 24 anatomical engravings 
Also a list of nearly 50 inventions, discoveries, and improvements, which are now required by the public and for which the London Society of Arts will award valuable premiums. Also a full account of J.R. Stafford's Olive Tar, The Great Electric Curative. New York, 1857, published by the Stafford Olive Tar Company, number 16 State Street, east side of Battery. <clears throat> Copyright secured according to law. So if anybody wants to uh, look up the Stafford Olive Tar Company and tell me what you find, that would be very interesting. <clears throat> I'm gonna see if I can locate where it talks about this wonderful olive tar. Two, two, two. The London Society of Arts. The necessity of breathing pure air. <clears throat> Aha! J.R. Stafford's Olive Tar. Yes, anatomical engravings, Detective Zen. I don't think we will be looking at them on screen, uh, on stream. Here's a preview of what they, they're just anatomical drawings. Actually, surprisingly accurate. <laughs> um, that one is, is less accurate. This is a uh, phrenology. It is a fr phrenological map of the human head. Uh <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, let's let's talk about olive tar. <clears throat> J.R. Stafford's olive tar is inhaled and applied, not taken, to cure disease. Infection cannot exist where the odor of olive tar is perceptible to the senses. Olive tar, indeed. Sounded like something you would hide under your bed from your parents during the turn of the last century. So, very bold claim here at the beginning. Infection cannot exist where the odor of olive tar is perceptible to the senses. I will note uh, this item is from 1857 and does not provide valid medical information. If you have medical questions, please consult your doctor. Rheumatic, neuralgic, and all other pains cease or are greatly relieved upon applying olive tar. <clears throat> the great desideratum of medical science is to obtain a fluid that will retain electromagnetism and which without injury to man can be used to restore the vitality which age, accident, or his disregard of natural laws has effected. Such a fluid is J.R. Stafford's olive tar. Its odor or aroma possesses the invaluable property of electrifying the oxygen of the atmosphere, creating ozone. And it is by breathing or inhaling this electrified atmosphere that the vitality of the system is increased and pain and disease are banished. <coughs> Best disclaimer. <laughs> If you have medical questions, please do not consult a jar of olives. Good advice. I'll seek out one of those phrenologists. Please stop electrifying our olives, Clyde. <laughs> <clears throat> when olive tar is applied to the surface of the body, it is at once absorbed by the pores and brought into contact with the nerves, which terminate at the surface. They, by their superior affinity, extract from the olive tar its electromagnetism, dispelling at once all pain and removing the disease which caused it. I think most of us today know that that is not an accurate 
description of how anything works, the nerves do not end. The anatomy as described here is, is not accurate. It says uh, the nerves terminate at the surface, which is not accurate. It says um, <clears throat> the nerves will extract from the olive tar its electromagnetism, which will immediately get rid of all pain and cure the disease that caused the pain. So this is where anti-vaxxers get their info. <laughs> I mean, 1857 uh, flim flam medical advertisements uh, Probably not dissimilar from some of the medical mis misinformation that is out there today. Um, <clears throat> if, if the inhalation and application of olive tar will banish pain, will cure diseases of dissimilar character, and will so vitalize the system that it will not be affected by the atmospheric miasmas or poisons, is not olive tar the greatest desideratum of medical science? <clears throat> Imagine how hard moving would be if nerves ended at the surface. Yeah, snake oil. Thank you, Geek Outs. Snake oil salesman. Um, essentially, that's what this is, although it's olive oil. It's why you need to lubricate with olive oil. Yeah. The chemistry of life and death. If I only bend my arm says Professor Playfair, or move my finger, there is a certain portion of the tissues destroyed, which must be supplied by my food. The more work a man performs, the more of those nitrogenous substances he requires. The other class of food serves a very important but quite different purpose, supplying animal heat. The temperature of our bodies is, in temperate climates at least, higher than the surrounding air, and in order to keep up this temperature, a combustion goes on, similar to that of an ordinary fire. The same products, carbonic acid, water, and ammonia, are evolved from the mouth of the furnace of the body and the mouth of a common chimney. In cold weather, a certain portion of heat is gradually abstracted from our bodies, which must be supplied by the combustion of our food or of the matter of our bodies. The colder the climate, therefore, the more heat giving must be the food. <laughs> there just aren't enough people who want to oil a snake. Oh dear. <laughs> A portion of the flesh is destroyed. Is the good professor a zombie? I mean, it's a very interesting description. The necessity of breathing pure air. I, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm looking to see if they get back to the olive stuff. Because we are focused on olives today. It doesn't seem like they do. They made such a big deal. There's an, up. Oh. oh dear, no, I think this all is about the olive tar. Cure for cancer. Did you know that we had a cure for cancer in 1857? Snake oiler was a nobler, noble profession back in the day. I mean, uh, wasn't it, um, I'm not going to say that this was a good person, but um, wasn't it P.T. Barnum that said there's a sucker born every minute? Who, who? Yeah, it was P.T. Barnum from Barnum and Bailey's Circus, um, <clears throat> who is famously quoted as saying, there's a sucker born every minute. Uh, and yeah, uh, that was sort of the philosophy then, and I would say probably a similar philosophy now of if you, if you can take advantage of people and get their money without getting in trouble for it, you're encouraged to do so. 
in today's society. At least, sometimes it feels that way to me. All right, cure for cancer. M. Landolfi, surgeon in chief of the Neapolitan army, is asserted to have seemingly cured cancer by the topical application of the chloride of bromine a combination, in combination with several other chlorides according to the following formula. Chloride of bromine, three parts. Chloride of zinc, two parts. Chloride an antimony, one part. Chloride gold, one part. Powdered licorice, sufficient to make a paste. The surrounding parts are protect, protected by an ointment of one, dra, uh, one dram of chloroform and one ounce of lard. M. Landolfi has been allowed six beds at La Saltpetrière, La Saltpetrière, Paris, to test the efficacy of his remedy. Suppose before trying the above, those having cancers should try a few of Stafford's blood purifying powders and a bottle of J.R. Stafford's olive tar. Olive tar is usually applied where the skin is not broken. Olive tar ointment is usually applied where the skin is bro broken. Apparently they have olive tar and olive tar ointment, and they are treated differently. J.R. Stafford's olive tar is the only remedy which combines within itself inhalation of its odor with the application of its fluid. The two great requisites for curing all diseases of the throat and lungs. So. They're basically telling you olive tar is used similar to like Vicks Vapo Rub. Uh, <laughs> cough, crypto cough, what? <laughs> yeah. Feed people pool cleaner and all their cancer worries are gone. Yeah, that um, chloride of bromine, chloride of zinc, chloride of antimony, chloride of gold, powdered licorice. Apparently, that will cure cancer, according to this book from 1857. Note, this book is not an actual medical text and was made by a snake oil salesman to sell a product that did nothing, except possibly endanger the life of the people that used it. Do not take medical advice from this stream. I am not a doctor. These are not medical texts. If you have a medical question, please consult your doctor. Sorry, I, these are weird, and I could go on forever. I will read this last one. I don't know if it has anything specific to do with olive tar, but it is on the same page as olive tar, so I will read it, and uh, we shall see. Sounds much more impressive when said like that. Do not ingest a solution made up of oxide of hydrogen and chloride of sodium, as it is not efficacious. Don't drink salt water. Yeah. That's like the, um, there was a thing a few years ago where people would try to, uh, try to get you, do gotchas uh, by asking people if they s supported the banning of all dihydrogen monoxide. Um, dihydrogen monoxide is just the name for water, H2O. Um, it's a chemical name for it. It's a possible way of saying it, but... Uh, Here is a treatment. Or use olive tar. Yeah. I don't know what the stain might be. <laughs> you saw someone ask that very question in a stream recently. They were su suitably ignored by everyone. Yeah. Yes, two hydrogens. Uh, di means two, right? Yeah, so dihydrogen monoxide is just H2O. It's water. <clears throat> Never, never tip your beaver to a fine lady and pass a poor widow without seeming to see her. 
never pass an aged man or woman without making a reverential ob obeisance unless your house is on fire. Never keep a boy to black your boots and attend to the stables while you frighten your wife out of the idea of keeping a nurse for the twins by constantly talking of hard time. Never remind people of personal deformity or of their relatives who have disgraced them. Never leave a letter unanswered and use the stamp which was enclosed to you to reply with on a letter to your own sweetheart. Never ride in a fine carriage and keep a score of servants while your widowed sister trudges along on foot and toils for her daily bread. I, I'm not exactly certain where this is going or why it's in this spot in the book. <clears throat> Never wear a finer coat than the merchant you owe for it or the tailor whom you have not paid for the making. Never turn a deaf ear to a woman in distress because you cannot see how you would be the gainer by her better, better condition. Never jest with a single woman about the anxiety of all women to be married, nor tell your wife you married her because you pitied her lonely condition. Never go to bed at ten, leaving your wife up till two with a sick baby and look pitchforks at her at the breakfast table because that meal is half an hour too late. Some of these are actually practical advice. Most of them are not. <clears throat> Never hear ungenerous strictures upon the conduct of a woman without a quiet smile instead of saying in, in thunder tones, it is false, sir. Sorry. Never hear ungenerous strictures upon the conduct of a woman with a quiet smile instead of saying in thunder tones, it is, fa it is false, sir. Thunder tones. I have never seen the word thunder tones before. Like undertones, yeah, thundertones. I've not, I've not witnessed before. Never tip your beaver. <laughs> I was not worth it. <laughs> um, never fall back from a bargain after the articles of agreement are drawn up and only need your signature to make them perfect. Never insult the modest by ribaldry the grave by levity, nor the pious by contempt of sacred things. Never be guilty of any of these offenses against decency and propriety. And propriety, If you are, you are not a gentleman. Well, that had nothing to do with olive tar at all. <laughs> God, you looked miserable lo being alone. Let's get married. Yeah, <laughs> Thundertones is your Ergenasi bard <laughs> bard barbarian now. <laughs> I actually think it's a typo. Uh, I think it's meant to be undertones. And, and shortly thereafter, they, um, they have a, a, an N instead of a U for the word up. I, I think it's a typo, but it's a great typo. Anyway, Olive Tar. J.R. Stafford's Olive Tar will cure cancer better than whatever cancer cure apparently existed in 1857. I mean, it's an easy claim to make considering there was no cure for cancer in 1857. So claiming that this will cure it better than that, I mean, better than not curing it is probably better, but also not curing it is not better than not. I don't know, anyway. <laughs> what? You were about to say that Thundertones was a great name, a good name for a band, but then you looked it up and it already is one. Of course it is. Of course it's a band. All right, so we have an item here. Thank God people don't take ridiculous treatments for serious conditions nowadays. Oh, I sense some um, undertone to that. Spring Housekeeper's List. I know basically nothing about this. Let's see uh, what I can learn. Undated, we don't know what year it's from.
we bought it. It's it's a broadside. We bought it in 2018. <clears throat> uh, does everybody know what a broadside is? I'll get an official definition. A broadside is a large sheet of paper printed on one side only. Historical, historically, broadsides were, broadsides were used as posters announcing events or proclamations, commentary in the form of ballads, or simply advertisements. <laughs> Part of a barn. They're a barbershop chorus in West Virginia. <laughs> so we have a broadside here. Um, <clears throat> As you can see, it is lengthy. And it is the spring housekeeper's list. We are here for business and it will pay you to read this list and get our prices. We have the following goods in stock, all of the finest grade, full weight from the most reliable packers in this country and Europe. We base our claim for patronage on the quality of our goods and our prices. We care not where you buy your fancy groceries. We can save you money. Try us. If goods are not as represented, money refunded. Condiments, sauces, etc. Imported tarragon vinegar, mushroom ketchup, pure French olive oil, half pints, pints and quarts, pure Italian olive oil, quart cans, Indian chutney, imported, tomato chutney, India relish, chili sauce, pure malt vinegar, salad dressing, genuine Tabasco sauce, Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce, tarragon mint leaves, celery salad, chow chow, domestic and imported, Shrewsbury mayonnaise, two sizes, Durkee's salad dressing, celery mustard, wine flavored mustard, red pepper sauce, green pepper sauce, German mustard, domestic. Finest French mustard, Bordeaux. Finest French mustard, Dijon. Celery salt, Shrewsbury tomato ketchup. Lindbrook tomato ketchup. Evaporated horseradish. French capers. White malt vinegar, raspberry vinegar. Domestic Worcestershire sauce. Gordon's Dilworth salad dressing. Olives, pickles, etc. Olives, domestic and imported, all sizes, 10 cents to 80 cents, all styles. Olives seeded and stuffed with pimentos, 10 cents to 45 cents. Pin money nickels, or pin money pickles, Mrs. Kids, sweet midget gherkins, celery pickles, Heinz sweet pickles, 25 cents and 35 cents. Richardson's pickles, finest on market, Lady Washington's high tea, Tiny Tim's, Jenny Lynn's, Little East Indians, etc. New England sour pickles, olives, Farsees and anchovies, or with anchovies. Olives, Farsees, what is that, I wonder? Pickled limes, celery salad. I have to look this one up now. <clears throat> oh. It's, it's just French for stuffed olives. I'm not going to read the whole broadside this time. Uh, <coughs> I guess it's a reminder of how much produce was seasonal before glo globalization. <coughs> it's a broad length, not a broadside. Dear Sprinkles Housekeeper, I brought this olive tar. I bought this olive tar in good faith that it would cure what ails me. It has done no such thing, and I demand my money back. <laughs> um, it's funny, I, I had never actually intended to do like a, a live show or anything. Um, that was a thing that I started thinking about in uh, like fall of 2019 um, <clears throat> is when I just started considering possibly doing something like this. Uh, but before that, when we've gotten new broadsides in, I've actually had my boss um, 
call the whole department together for like a five minute meeting to just have me read the broadside for the department. We talked about like having me do staged readings of broadsides as an event. Um, so I may need to do a show where I just read broadsides the entire time. Because we have some really interesting ones. That one is, is actually one of the more boring broadsides I've seen. Chow Chow is a combination of green tomatoes, cabbage, onion, and peppers. Some have carrots, beans, cauliflower, or peas. It's then pickled and served cold. I knew it was some sort of like um, greens salad. Uh, thank you, Hannah, for looking up what it exactly is. <clears throat> So next I have a folder of pamphlets from the Pompeian Company, Pompeian Olive Oil. Would I also sing broadside ballads? I mean, I suppose, but I don't know that I know any. <clears throat> and it would have to be on a day where my sinuses are behaving more than today. I, I am sorry for all of the throat clearing that has happened today. Pompeian olive oil, recipes for salads. Olive oil added to your diet will add years to your life. This was a, this, this pamphlet was apparently um, provided at Preston Brothers, groceries and provisions in Troy, Pennsylvania. So this was a pamphlet created by the Pompeian olive oil company, but it's got a spot down here where like the grocery store could put their name and then these would just be out for people to, to take at the grocery store. <clears throat> oh no, I mean, if I time it right, it is possible that I could do something while a cannon is literally being fired outside this building. Because Virginia Tech has a cannon that they fire Generally only at football games when a touchdown is made, but uh, occasionally there'll be something on the drill field where they're uh, doing maneuvers or something and the Corps of Cadets, like, they'll fire the cannon. <clears throat> in, incidentally, the cannon left the state of Virginia for the first time in, I wanna say 2018 or 2019. Uh, when it went to Bristol, Tennessee for a football game. It was the first time ever the cannon had left the state of Virginia. So this is a pamphlet from the Pompeian Olive Oil Company, uh, giving recipes for making some mayonnaise, French dressing. The use of olive oil has vastly increased in the last few years. More olive oil is used on the table than ever before. Olive oil builds flesh and healthy fat, nourishes and regulates the body, makes the liver normal and active, and gives a clear complexion. The curative and invigorating properties of high-grade, pure olive oil are too many to enumerate. The presence for olive oil to animal fat is readily gaining ground. The preference for olive oil to animal fat is readily gaining, rapidly gaining ground. <clears throat> It is wholesome, palatable, and quickly generates the heat and energy which only a fat food can furnish the human system and to keep it running smoothly. <clears throat> there has never been a regular user of Pompeian olive oil who did not become devoted to it. Whether he used it as an article of diet or as a medicine, olives grown in a mild, warm climate at a height of over 2,000 feet above sea level mature and produce a mild, delicate oil, whereas olives grown in a low, hot climate, the oil in the olive will rancify when on the tree and in that way produce that acid-full olive oil so often eaten by the American public. To the people who think that they do not like olive oil, we say try Pompeian Virgin Luca olive oil. The flavor is fruity, not oily. A part of its quality comes from the combination of sun and soil that makes olives grow to perfection in the Luca district of Italy. A part is, is so they're, <clears throat> they're claiming that California olives are rancid on the tree and therefore make bad olive oil. <clears throat> Convince the band that they need to rehearse the 1812 overture? Virginia was non-canon for a period of time. 
Oh dear. Read some Doctor Who facts we could then see what's canon. Oh, oh, be right, UK. If we had Doctor Who stuff, I would totally do that. I think, did I? I did. I did. I was like, that made me think of what sci-fi shows I have. And I do have a script from the original series of Star Trek. But we looked at that. So <clears throat> that's on stream somewhere, uh, on the VOD somewhere. <laughs> Having a blast with the puns. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, don't visit Pompeii during the hot season. Oh, dear. <clears throat> In comparison, we have the Bertoli Company. And we have the Bertoli Olive Oil Handbook. Featuring 25 delicious Italian Mediterranean recipes with important nutritional information. And this booklet, I think this booklet is newer. Uh, and I think this booklet is very much taking after the way that wines are marketed. <clears throat> Dear consumer, I am truly pleased to introduce the Bertoli Olive Oil Handbook. And I'm particularly excited because it highlights more than 128 years worth of heritage Bertoli Olive Oil uh, brings to the food scene. It also illustrates how using just a little olive oil can go a long way toward reducing fat in your diet. In fact, most of the 25 recipes featured here fall below, <coughs> fall below the new government dietary guidelines. These guidelines state total fat consumption should fall below 30% of daily caloric intake. By using a small amount of Bertoli olive oil in these delectable recipes, you have a cost-effective way to add flavor and help to reduce saturated fat. <clears throat> now take a moment to review this booklet and its sun-drenched Italian Mediterranean foods. All of these have been personally tasted and evaluated by me and my team of culinary and nutrition experts. I'm sure you'll enjoy all of them just as much as we did. And remember, if you want it to be better, it better be Bertoli. Please feel free to write to us to share your thoughts about our new handbook and, of course, Bertoli olive oil. Eat well, live long, be happy. William C. Monroe, President, CEO, Bertoli, USA. This, honestly, I looked for illustrations of olives. This is one of the only pictures of olives I could find in our collections. At all. We have botanical illustration books. We have books of actual botanical illustrations, but they're books of botanical illustration of American plants and olives apparently are not considered to be American plants even though they're grown here, therefore they were not included. I could not find anything that had a botanical illustration of, of olives. This is the only like realistic olive illustration I was able to find. Oh, Detective Zen! Um, yeah, uh, thank you for, for stopping by. I hope that uh, you have a good day. I will only be on for another like 20 minutes or so, um, but I will see you again another time. Thanks for joining. <clears throat> so pamphlet, Bertoli gives recipes. These are more modern recipes, uh, things that we would probably be looking at today as compared to like the 1970s book that had the frightening gelatin recipes for olives. Um, apparently this also included coupons for 50 cents off with no expiration date. So I suppose technically they would still be usable today, but we will not be cutting them out of the book because it's part of the archives. But I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because I have more things to look at and we still need to go to the Livre des Simple Medicines. Simple Medicines. I have volume two from Malincrot Collection of Food Classics. The Malincrot Collection of Food Classics, volume two, a treatise on adulterations of food by F. Akum. 
which is something that came up when I just used the keyword olive. And so I pulled it, and I believe it had an index of some sort, and I was able to actually locate something on olives. As you can see, this is a reprint. Oh, it's olive oil, page 239. So this is a, a reprint of a much older work, um, a, treat, a treatise on adulterations of food and culinary poisons, exhibiting the fraudulent sophistications of bread, beer, wine, spiritus liquors, tea, coffee, cream, confectionery, vinegar, mustard, pepper, cheese, olive oil, pickles, and other articles employed in domestic economy and methods of detecting them. That is the title. <clears throat> by Frederick Akum, operative, or operative chemist and member of the Principal Academies and Societies of Arts and Sciences in Europe, published in Philadelphia by Abraham Small in 1820. And this is a modern reprinting from 1976. <clears throat> and you can see the discolorations. That's because they took pains to make sure that you knew that this was a reprinting of an older work. That the original probably has those discolorations, but poisonous olive oil. This commodity is sometimes contaminated with lead because the fruit which yields the oil is submitted to the action of the press between leaden plates, and it is moreover a practice, particularly in Spain, to suffer the oil to become clear in leaden cisterns before it is brought to market for sale. The French and Italian olive oil is usually free from this impregnation. Olive oil is sometimes mixed with oil of poppy seeds, but by exposing the mixture to the freezing temperature, the olive oil freezes while that of the poppy seeds remains fluid, and as oils which freeze with most difficulty are most apt to, be, to become rancid, olive oil is deteriorated by the mixture of poppy oil. Good olive oil should have a pale yellow color, somewhat inclining to green, a bland taste without smell, and should congeal at 38 degrees Fahrenheit. In this country, it is frequently met with rancid. <clears throat> the presence of lead is detected by shaking. In a stopped vial, one part of the suspected oil with two parts of th or two or three parts of water impregnated with sulfuretted hydrogen. That would be hydrogen sulfide, right? Uh, this agent will render the oil of a dark brown or black color if any metal de deleterious to health be present. The practice of keeping this oil in pewter or leaden cisterns, as is often the case, is objectionable because the oil acts upon the metal. The dealers in this commodity assert that it prevents the oil from becoming rancid, and hence some retailers often suffer a pewter measure to remain immersed in the oil. So this, this is a book from originally from the 1820s that is talking about concerns in food um, and that was the entire chapter on olive oil uh, stating that uh, lead plates and lead cisterns were sometimes used in the manufacture of olive oil meaning that olive oil could be adulterated and um, give you lead poisoning which in 1820 seems like it was a perfectly valid concern. <clears throat> Good old hydrogen sulfide. <laughs> um, let's see. Then we have a modern recipe book called A Taste of Ancient Rome by Ilaria Gozzini uh, Giacosa, translated by Anna Herklotz. Forward by Mary Taylor Simetti. Uh, this one had an index that listed olives. <clears throat> 2, 3, 14, 24, and 199, as well as talking about Calabrian olives, green olives, preserved green olives, and olive paste. We'll take a quick look here. It didn't pop up really quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. 
but there was olive stuff in there. There's something else that I want to get, get to really quickly. Uh, we have a book called Cherished Greek Recipes that also had some olive recipes in it. The Classical Cookbook by Andrew Dalby and Sally Granger, as well as Greek cooking. Um, I had to go to Greek cookbooks in order to find something about olives in our collections because we don't have just stuff about olives. Um, it's possible, but I was not able to immediately find anything. Um, our extension division does stuff about how to grow certain crops and things like that, but we don't really grow olives in Virginia, and so I don't know that there was anything about growing olives in our extension division materials, um, but they're also not cataloged in a way that I could easily find that. I basically would have had to go through all of their bulletins year by year, page by page, to see if I could find anything on olives, and uh, I did not have time for that. So. Um, I did not end up getting anything from Extension on Olives. Hi, Abyssal Licorice. <laughs> Today we are looking at Olives, Abyssal Licorice. Um, and we are doing so because uh, I'm a big fan of the Streampunks RPG group, and on Monday they start a brand new uh, TTRPG game um, call th that they have titled The Barony of Olives, and so in honor of them, I decided to focus my entire show today on um, olives and just see what we had in the archives about olives. Uh, so that's that's been our exploration today. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Streampunks and their upcoming role-playing game show, um, you can find them on Twitter at StreampunksRPG. So, uh, olives are delicious. Yes, I love olives, actually. <clears throat> Olives are pretty cool by themselves, and so the fact that... I, the reason I picked them as a topic, because it, it is actually a really difficult topic uh, to just say, what do we have about olives, and go and find whatever I can find about olives. Um, actually quite difficult. Uh, but the reason I did it was because of the Streampunks, because they are awesome, and I wanted to do something and I get to pick the topics on this show. So, I love the insert here. The cover of this book is washable. Um, the cover of this book has basically nothing on it and appears like it could be washed. Uh, but <clears throat> this is Livre de Simple Medicines, or the Book of Simple Medicines. <clears throat> and I did, I did remember, yes, I have prepared. Um, usually I have not looked at the things beforehand and we just explore them together. Because this topic was especially difficult to locate materials on, I did some pre-looking. I haven't like read the thing, but I at least verified that there was content on olives. So I had a bookmark. Um, this is the page on olives. <laughs> oh wow, that's certainly a text. Um, as mentioned before, this was, uh, this is a 15th century text from France about herbs. <laughs> There is a companion book that is the translation of this text. So that is not only 15th century handwriting, but it is 15th century handwriting in French. There is no way I can read this to you. Let me see. I didn't bookmark in this book because that would have made too much sense. Give me one second while I find the translation. 201-324. No. Thankfully, it's all in alphabetical order, so...
Should be easy to find, right? Aha, here we go. <clears throat> <coughs> Let's hope it's written by someone else. I should actually look at the introduction. So this is uh, Codex Bruxellanis, Bruxell Bruxellanis, Bruxellensis 4. Sorry, uh, B-R-U-X-E-L-L-E-N-S-I-S -L -L -E 4, 1024. A 15th century French herbal <clears throat> introduction and adapted text by Carmelia Opsomer, English translation by Enid Roberts and William S. Stern. It's got commentaries. <clears throat> the following translation renders into English the transcript into modern French published in 1980 by Carmelia Opsomer of the Codex Bruxellensis 4 1024 with missing material reinstated by her, notably from the Codex Wolfen, Wolfenbutel 84 10 August 2 degrees? It differs from her work and from the original manuscripts in numbering each main entry for convenience of indexing and citation. Added explanatory matter, such as identification, has been inserted in parentheses, either between brackets or standard parentheses. Scientific names adopted here, while in general agreeing with those proposed by Alpsomer, uh, sometimes diverge from them to keep the text close to the French original. The French names for medicinal plants and drugs and some ailments have generally been retained in the text and always in the headings, especially as their scientific or English equivalents may be disputable. The indices will serve as a guide to annotated headings dealing with most of these as also to those of the French version. <clears throat> The work which scholars have agreed to call the Livre des Simples Médecins uh, and of which the manuscript for 1024 in the Bibliothèque Royale Brussels, uh, sorry, accent went weird there, Brussels, uh, contains a version of special quality, is one of the major texts of medieval science. Its wide distribution testifies to that. Under such titles as Secreta uh, Salernitana, Livre de Secre de Salerne, or Arboriste, it has come down to us in 23 other manuscripts of the 15th and one of the 16th century, but the old catalogues of libraries preserve traces of numerous lost manuscripts. The birth of printing gave it a wide distribution. Some 10 printed editions, today of extreme rarity, appeared between 1488 and 1548 under the title of uh, Arbolare, or Grand Herbier en Francois, sorry, <laughs> translated into French as the Great Herbel, 1528, it became the basis of the English herbals of the 16th century. Nevertheless, it was not again reprinted during the second half of the 16th century. The discovery of the new world with an inflow of new drugs and the introduction of chemical remedies by Paracelsus and his followers drastically altered pharmacology. The Livre de Simple Medicines thus constitutes the end point and indeed a balance sheet showing the assets and the liabilities of a long scientific and medical tradition going back to antiquity, that of the medieval herbal. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, I know I butchered some of the pronunciations there of some of the titles in uh, French and Spanish and Italian and whatever. Um, I hope that the point got across. It's an old book that sort of gives insight into medicinal knowledge or belief uh, during the medieval period. And there is an entry here on olives. And you can see the illustration of the olives. <clears throat> and so I'm going to read to you what it says about olives. <clears throat> olives. Oleana Europe Europeana. Cultivated olive. Let's, olives are the fruit of a tree. There are two kinds, the cultivated ones and the wild ones. <clears throat> there are three kinds of cultivated olives. The green ones, which have a harsh savor, the completely black ones, which are quite ripe, and those which are intermediate between the green and the ripe ones and which have a reddish color. And uh, Dioscorides calls these uh, jacintines. Yacintines. 
J A C I N T I N E S. <clears throat> Item. The medium olives are less harmful than the others which are black because they have less oil. And they strengthen the stomach slightly. All the oils form a humor which corresponds to their color. Item. Galen said that red olives strengthen the stomach, but very black olives rot immediately, soften the stomach, and moisten the belly. These olives are suitable for remedies. If they are crushed and placed on burns, they remove blisters. Again, I will note, this is not a medical show. <clears throat> this book of uh, herbal medicinal remedies from the Middle Ages should not be consulted for use in your own medical needs. If you have medical concerns, please consult your doctor. <clears throat> oil de olive. Olive oil. Oye de olive. There are several kinds, fresh and old. The fresh oil, which is made of unripe olives, is called onfasium. One, recognize good oil, one recognizes good oil by its good smell and its good flavor. The greener the olives are, the more the oil is cold and dry and strengthens the stomach. Item. Fresh oil made of black olives is moderately hot and moist. It softens the stomach, moistens the belly, and changes easily into bilious humors. There is no harm in oil made of unripe olives. When the oil is very old, it becomes harsh and is not good to eat, but it is good for remedies. <coughs> harmful. <laughs> Black olives are apparently harmful, but good for remedies. So they'll hurt you if you eat them, but you can use them as medicine, which is a very interesting interpretation. Uh, but yeah, so this is from the 15th century Europe, their beliefs on the medical uses for olives. Apparently olive, olives, crushed olives, crushed black olives are good for healing burns. I don't think personally that you would necessarily want to put olive oil on burns. Uh, that seems probably not the best way to deal with them, but this is as I said a moment ago, medical information from the 1400s. So please do not try to use it today. Um, medical science has advanced quite a lot, and if you have medical concerns, you should consult your own physician who will know modern methods for treating them rather than relying on a book that talks about the humors and balancing them. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, the technical measure. Good. Very specific. <clears throat> but this, so this was the most interesting thing that I was able to find on olives in our collections. Um, it was an interesting challenge to try and come up with anything I could find on olives. I'm glad I did it because I really do enjoy the, the entertainments that the stream punks bring and so personally, I wanted to do a show, <clears throat> plus Eric, <clears throat> Eric, who is the uh, game master for the Streampunks RPG group, is <clears throat> consistently raiding this channel for this show, um, and so I wanted to also highlight their upcoming program as a thank you for him regularly bringing viewers to come and join the Archival Adventures show. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so I will just note once again, they do have a new uh, program coming up um, starting this coming Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific time on twitch.tv slash qtimes, where the Streampunks RPG group will be uh, starting a Changeling the Dreaming role-playing game show. Um, and it should be a good time. The title of the show is Barony of Olives, which is what inspired this entire program about olives today. I am just looking <clears throat> to see what we are gonna be doing next week. And I think, <clears throat> I think what we're gonna do next week I was considering possibly taking a break next week because it is spring break here, but I'm
probably not going to do so. I think what we're going to do is I'm going to pull old copies of the Ladies Home Journal and we're just going to look through them. <clears throat> we have <clears throat> Ladies Home Journal going back quite a long ways. Uh, I know because I last year I did an exhibit on the 19th Amendment, which was the Women's Suffrage Amendment here in the United States, and uh, found articles about women's suffrage and uh, women being allowed to vote in presidential elections for the first time uh, in the Ladies Home Journal, and it was a great resource for that. And at the time, those copies of the Ladies Home Journal were part of our publicly available art and architecture collections. Um, and because of their age and sort of the fragile condition that they were in, uh, we transferred them into the holdings of special collections and university archives. Um, and so I know we have some really nice old copies of the Ladies Home Journal, and I thought it might be interesting for us to look at those on stream sometime. It is Women's History Month, and I think next Wednesday we're going to look at those. So I hope that you will join me again next week to, um, to take a look at some uh, a, a ladies' magazine from the turn of the century, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. That is the time period that we will look at. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up <clears throat> and see who we're going to raid, if it will load. Come on, Twitch. Tell me who's live. Um, I'm just looking to see, because... If there were somebody playing a game that had relevant content, then I might do it, but I don't see any olive-based games at the moment. So I think what we will do is <clears throat> the Monterey Bay Aquarium does have their kelp forest cam live right now, and we will head over there uh, for some nice, relaxing underwater kelp forest action on the Monterey Bay Aquarium's channel. Um, I hope that you have a wonderful Wednesday. I hope that I see you again in the near future. I hope that you might join me again next week as we look at old issues of the Ladies Home Journal from the beginning of the 20th century. I hope that you enjoyed uh, seeing what I was able to find on the topic of olives and that you might um, consider checking out the Stream Punks for their new show next Monday night, A Barony of Olives, coming up. Um, Again, not sponsored by them, just wanted to throw them a shout out since um, they do raid this show regularly. Um, it was lovely seeing all of you. I'm going to go ahead and set up that raid. Um, it was lovely seeing all of you. I'm going to go Whoa. ahead and set up that raid. Um, what happened It's lovely seeing all of you. I'm going to go. You should be muted. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but apologies for that. Let me set this raid going. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for joining me today, and I will see you again in the future. Um, get out there, find some wonderful things in your own archives, uh, explore history, learn about the world. Um, I think this was a fascinating two hours on olives. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.